Alrighty, traders, what is going on? Uh, Kyle Williams here. We're going to do, as always, the June 2024 recap. Um, for those who have briefly commented and or mentioned to me, sorry, there will, I guess, I mean, it's kind of time coming past, but frankly, there was really one main event of May 2024 that really, uh, you know, made the month what it was, which is why I post that last video lesson that I had made uh, for Clover, and I just uploaded it to, to YouTube to kind of replace the May monthly recap. So if you haven't seen that, Go watch that. I just dive really deep into the FFI loss and you know how it came to be, and then how it resulted in you know pretty much one of my my worst months um, in a long time, and giving back you know half my year. So that's that. Now going into this month, um, obviously I got my ass whooped in May, and I think after reflecting and just kind of regrouping, um, I came into June really prepared and really ready to rumble. Um, and now I can you know confidently say in hindsight after now June is over, you know, I can think I can confirm that, right? We, or not we, I made $260,000. Um, and now you might think, wow, that's impressive, Kyle. You know, you, you've made back your losses in May. You know, technically you're up 60K over both months, which is 30K a month, um, which is true. It's not incorrect. However, I don't necessarily view it that way because the overall drawdown of this FFIE loss is still happening, right? I have not recovered this quote unquote all time highs of my trading equity, right? Um, you, you know, the reality is you want to count from the actual time this got this loss got taken. And so I was up, you know, like $170,000 before FFIE happened on the 16th here. So roughly speaking, we still have, you know, a little under $100,000 to go. I'm not really including what's happened in July so far. So really, we're probably somewhere in the 50 to 70 range, thousand more dollars to go. Either way, it doesn't really matter. I'll pass it when I pass it. I don't really care. Um, it's just something I immediately notice of like, you know, looking at it psychologically, I like, feel good. Like, oh, you made bag maze losses. But the reality is um, I don't want to just forget and and completely just dismiss what happened and how, how, I, how I handle it because I do not want that to ever happen again. Um, and so in one way to easy, in one way the mind can easily uh, you know, forget about it is if you recover very quick from it, right? I always, I always mention my first really, 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 really big loss back in uh, February 2021, where I lost, I lost ninety thousand dollars on this day on February 11th, 2021. But I made you know fifty thousand dollars or forty thousand dollars elsewhere, so only it being a negative forty thousand dollar day. And on top of that, it was so jam packed with so much opportunity. I still made six figures by the end of the week. So it was as if that draw, not even draw down, that tough loss was immediately forgotten and you can argue in many ways at that time you know three or four years ago now that loss or those lessons from that loss really weren't cemented um until much more much more mistakes were made so um from a mental standpoint you know i have not forgotten this um certainly don't ever want to forget it and to make sure it's just any every mistake in the book on that day doesn't repeat um now that being said going into june you know a great start to that you know as much as may was caused by FFIE. You'll you'll see here as we go through the recap. June a, a significant point of June was also FFIE of me just trading it well and ultimately making a very large portion of my month. There's very few trades in here that really added to the bottom line. FFIE is probably gosh, uh, I would say 70 80 percent of this two hundred sixty thousand dollars here. Um, so anyways, let's let's jump right in. Let's let's get right to it. Um, Obviously, you see the biggest day of the month, which is $164,000 on June 3rd. And yes, what do you know? That was F558. So what on earth was that? Um, you know, obviously, you heard me talk about in last month's video just about how this disaster happened. What you didn't really see is how it ended up playing out after it was all said and done. Um, so obviously, once this huge dump day from May 17th down from 4 to 1, um, it offered quite a few days of this $1 support level to kind of form before it broke down. And that was kind of exactly what I was playing for. You know, it happened a little bit quicker than I maybe had anticipated, but they did have earnings, which really kind of, I guess, accelerated that breakdown. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of holding through earnings, but in this particular case, I really thought it out and thought it through um, and, and what were the risks here. And, and I and I took those risks and it worked out great. Um, on top of the fact I had locked in a bunch of unrealized or unrealized and realized profits leading up to this the earnings report because they did know it came in or I came along and why did I know that well after the huge pull from four to one you can notice this this is a gap up you know it gaps up from one dollars to two dollars let's see if I can get the full intraday here I probably can't I have to probably go to specific days 
yeah, I won't get it, huh? If I load it here. Um, but you can see again, for that day it closed from four to one, it gapped up the next day in the new week um, up into $2. Yeah, I don't have it here, but I luckily I have the trades. So we'll look, I'll go back to the daily chart for now so you guys can see what day we're talking about here, um, just for reference again. This day right here, May 20th, okay? It's a huge gap up. Close at one, opens at like 180, spikes well up to 220. Um, if you go into that trade here, that is this day. Now, I already had a swing position, a starter swing position from that huge dump day from four to one. I had like a two something average, if I'm not mistaken correctly. And so gapping up back, back into two, I was like, okay, I don't love that I could have just covered it at $1 and then just reshorted the same size of two. Nonetheless, I still thought there was a lot of resistance to be taken over. Like again, I had to get over the th three or the 230s, which it didn't. Then there was like the 260s and then there was $3. And ultimately there was also then three through four. To me, it was very confident at that point that I had mistimed the front side so poorly that now that the ultimate backside was in and it was just a matter of time, you know, whether it was a few days, a few weeks for this to really come and fall apart. Um, and so you do see me trying to add short to that, that swing idea. I do cover it thinking it might go through the, the 220s, 230s. It immediately fails, and so I add right back, um, cover some locking some in, and then reshorting, and then reshorting as well. Um, well. Actually covering something and then reshorting, realizing I'm just being a little bit overly antsy. Um, so this really is kind of a mute, you know, nothing here. Um, ultimately, I ended up having like a, I believe a 170, 180 average or so. Um, looking and planning for again this thing to fade back well under sub one, maybe in the, into the 50s. At this again, at this point in time, I don't really know how low it's going to go. I just know I want to be there for it. And so, coming into the next few days, um, if we, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have the trades because not much happened. Um, there was one day. I think it was this day on the 21st where it did spike. Let's actually just go into the intraday so I can show you um, where I did lock in some more money just being that it was a inefficiency midday, yeah. And so I didn't cover any on the swing idea, right? Uh, you know, 120s was about as low as it went the previous day, and so there's no reason for me to get out. I want much lower. But when it did spike into the midday, you know, a lot of people who have been short selling a long time or maybe have seen some enough of my videos, you know I am sometimes a fan of like that midday bounce short idea. And so I did short into like the 160 area and get it in and red green was I believe like somewhere in the 170s. Um, so it was a good risk reward area just to risk red green on whatever ads I took for today. And then immediately cover those into the you know low 130s, one high one or sorry low 140s, high 130s, and I made an extra six or seven k, and so that was kind of the idea here, right? Like as because again it gapped up because they said they were going to release earnings in the, in the next week or two. I knew going into that that it was already be risky enough to hold something through earnings, and so the more cushion I can put on the trade and or the better average I can have in my favor the better and more comfortable I'm gonna be for one, to be able to hold the earnings, but then two, potentially be able to add once the confirmation that earnings, the earnings are crap, right? That was kind of why I was overly aggressive on the front side because I knew how awful of a position this company was in. And now that they're releasing earnings, I was pretty confident that that was gonna become relatively aware um, for everyone who wasn't aware. Um, it ended up being much worse, which we'll go into very shortly here. So anyways, you know, at this point, you know, I have, after adding a little more, um, I now have like probably a 160s average or so, but again, with, with well over five figures locked in at this point. And so now it's just a matter of time, like, you know, will we, and will and when will we get this breakdown of $1? Now, of course it did have to wait until earnings came along. I thought maybe we'd get the breakdown before then. Um, but then, so earnings are announced. Uh, and when earnings came out, it was way worse than people expected in the sense that originally, I think their what outstanding share account was 40 million. It came out that they had uh, 400 million. Like they 10x the float in a very short time frame. Uh, if not a significant amount of that was in this run up. So even getting a you know what is a 20,000 percent run up from four cents to four dollars, the float was increasing. That that's just how powerful this front side move was. Um, and so when that came became aware, I mean this was. Uh, it, it was a shock to everybody. Uh, and that ultimately resulted with, with this huge gap down and then huge fade on the 29th, which we'll go into um, here. Now, uh, let's see, where is it? Now, in my brine, again, my idea was the 50s. Uh, however, once the, you know, the kind of, the a cat came out of the bag, the skeleton came out of the closet, so to speak, that it's not 40 million shares, it's 400 million shares. I was like, oh crap, this is like, way worse than we thought. Um, I think this might go much lower than I expected. And so, uh, you know, when it went 50, I didn't cover a thing. And I said, this might see like 30. 
that was kind of the new in hindsight i wish i didn't adjust as, as much but again in this if you were watching this price action live i mean you saw how heavy it was um it, it was almost looking bounceless for a long time and yeah you have these little pops here and there but i mean it was it was insanely heavy and so for me i was like yeah no i'm, I'm this is gonna like i'm gonna hold this lower um and so i had that plan that's kind of what i thought would happen um maybe they'll now it'll probably show it if you go to like a monthly candle um ultimately i ended up overstaying right so had i covered let's say hypothetically had i covered all in like the 40s there once it went sub 50 um it would have probably locked in somewhere closer to like 200 grand um so for losing you know almost 400 and to make half back at 200 that'd be really awesome however again in my brain i'm like no i'm holding till 30 or sub 30 uh and so you know when this panic down in the 29th you know the 30th and the 31st i just said i'm not covering and it, it bounced a little bit back went to the 60s somewhat of the 70s um just i just stayed true i was like you know what? i'm still in from the mid ones like i have no problem swinging this longer to get it back below 30 until right finally to get you to the, the finish line here of how this trade happened um i believe going into over the weekend and then into the third is when roaring kitty came out and said he actually owns gme again gme gapped up from somewhere in the mid 20s all the way up to 40 pre-market um and again we know now that ffa has zero relation to f to gme but for whatever reason, if you go like on um, FFIE subreddit, um, for whatever, just all over Rory Kitty's stream when he had a stream, which we'll talk about in a bit. For some reason, there's this massive crowd of people that tie FFIE to GME when there has been zero relation, zero, absolute zero. I, I don't understand where the connection kind of came. Thankfully, now they're completely separate. They don't even trade at all. Um, makes more sense. Um, there's some justice in the world, right? You know, I'm kidding. But uh, I just couldn't figure it out. But all I knew is that it follows each other. And so when that happened, I said, you know what? I cannot risk this this trend continuing. And God forbid GME goes back to who knows how high. And FFA, for whatever reason, wants to go back to 80 90 a dollar. Like, I can't afford to give back as much as I've made on, or as much unrealized as I have on this. And so I end up covering it all in pre-market right when it opens. Um, you know, in this case, what was it? 4 a.m. Eastern. Thankfully for me, I was in Europe. And so Europe time... When the time zone I was in, it was like 10 a.m., so I was well awake by then. Um, and so I covered all, right? This is that trade here um, in pre market, right? When it opens, I just covered all right here. Um, unfortunately, I ended up getting like in you know, a mid 60, like 66, 67 average. And so, you know, unfortunately, could have covered it in the 30s, end up covering in the 60s. You know, again, gave back probably 30 grand or so in unrealized gains. Um, so instead of making 200, I made like in the 260, like 268, 268,000, um, which gives you the bulk of this day. Um, which again, gives me a great start, but in the many ways, I didn't really consider this part of my month, so to speak, like mentally I knew that's awesome, but again, we're still in the hole. Um, it doesn't really contribute to my month of anything. Again, like I said, in hindsight, it was, either, it was actually better for me to probably cover that all in the last few days of the month. Cause actually that, that would have ended up making May gr green. <laughs> like I actually, if I covered, um, you know, when it was in the thirties, I mean, this, this would have been almost become a break-even month again i would have made 200 grand and it would have actually become you know zero uh, almost perfectly so it is what it is again uh sucks that i give that much money back but again i'm happy to have covered it because who knows what would have happened you know at the time this could have gone again this could i could have given way more back now what ends up happening is it actually just craps itself right and actually never really goes back to that price for much longer um there are some spikes here and there that it does get back that you can see here but i did get a little um not much, but a little tilted because of that. I thought to myself, damn it. Like I, I played it safe, which I'm happy I did. But the reality is it, that's as high as it really got pre-market in the high mid seventies. And it only went lower from there back to at least 50 cents where, it, you know, it would have been nice to cover there. Now, because of that, I tried to start getting short again with smaller size for a swing back to 30 cents. I thought to myself, you know, it is still inevitable that this is going to go there. It may take another couple more days or a couple more weeks, but like that, the thesis is still alive um especially now that it's kind of decoupling from gme i'm like let's get reshort and so there are a few times here i think it was on this day i started shorting a sub 50 and then got squeezed out um i think i tried to do it again somewhere in here and then it's covered because then again gme started running so i was like you know what i just can't risk it and I, thank god i covered it because it was a much smaller loss than it could have been or than it would have been if i held so lost another three or four k trying to reshort it here and there ultimately is what led to the end of the week if we go here right um that's what led to these red days here in the middle of the week. But on, on Friday, the 7th, is when GME and Roaring Kitty came out and said, you know, I'm going to do a live stream. 
Um, and so we look at GME here. That's kind of when was it? This was the gap up day when he announced he was actually long, right? Opened up at 40, went back down to, to the tw 20s. But then these two days here, um, going into specifically the fifth, if we just go into like the intraday, um, is when he announced he was going to stream. Unfortunately, I was actually pretty late to this. Because again, you're going to run. Remember, I am in Europe. I'm not really trading full time at this point. I'm trying to keep watch on everything, but I'm also doing excursions. I'm running around trying to then make it back to the market open by 3:30. It was a little bit of a mess at some days, but ultimately, once I realized how big this was. Um, I started getting long again. And so I was pretty late. I wish I was a little bit early in noticing it and getting long in the mid 30s. I did end up getting long in like the high 30s, 39, 40 area uh, and swung it overnight. Uh, if we look at the trades here, let's get rid of FFIE. So GME overnight here. Um, yeah, scaled in on this pullback, bought some more and then bought some more. So kind of three three part entry here. Um, obviously felt very comfortable swinging overnight now that I was up, you know, about seven, six or $7 a share. Uh, and then coming into the next day, sold immediately some right out the open when it opened up at 60. But then they announced earnings. And they weren't expected to announce earnings. And so when that happens, that's usually not a good sign. It can also give similar vibes to FFIE, which is FFIE didn't really have an earnings date. And then all of a sudden say, hey, you know, in a week from now, we're going to do earnings. You know, that's a little bit more of a heads up. GME gave you no heads up. They just immediately released earnings this quickly, which caused it to drop. And usually when that's the case is because they want to get something done sooner than usual, which in this case for GME was an offering. So I sold the rest thankfully here because I knew something was sketchy and up. Um, did I immediately know an offering was going to come? No. Um, even though that's also likely, but again, I'm not really thinking that at this point. I'm just happy to have got out of my of my lung. Did give some money back, but ultimately locked in like $28,000. Um, but again, I was actually, I actually remember this day, I was in Florence when this happened. So I was literally walking around Florence selling my GME and then totally missed the their earnings announcement. Um, wasn't looking at my phone at the time. And then started trying to trade it from my phone. And uh, this the, all these trades here were just practically made me break even. It, it didn't help me at all, unfortunately. Um, the entire day was this this long here. Um, but yeah, so that was fun. Obviously, you know, I can look back and think, man, if I had, I, had I prioritized being in front of the screens, would I have traded better? You know, yeah, sure. Uh, maybe I would have tried to short this offering news, but again, I'm not really a, a breaking news trader like that. Um, and frankly, if I wasn't in Europe, I'd be in America, and I'm never awake this early. In fact, it already benefited me enough that I was already in Europe to sell it up here. Otherwise, if I was in America, I would have probably woken up right somewhere around here, if not later. It's where I would have given most of my gains back anyway. So just thankful to to have made some money long on it when I did. Um, in fact, the entire GME AMC kind of era, um, I had actually, I think I'm pretty even between longs and shorts. Normally you'd think like I'm majority short um, profits from these, from this run and this run. But the reality is I'm actually, I'm actually pretty even, like 50-50, both long and short, about, about the equal amount of money. Um, so that's pretty cool to see. Um, does it mean I'm better longing than, sh than shorting in this case? I think it's a little bit of both. I was never really that aggressive shorting these. And I was maybe a bit more active on trying to long them. So there's it's a bit give and take for both. Um, but anyways, that was the first week. So obviously that made the majority of my month of 194000 The next week wasn't really anything special. I lost 10K this week. Um, this was the end of my kind of Europe travels here. Uh, so just kind of taking it easy. But also not much was going on, so I wasn't pushing it either. Um, one of the things that didn't make it easier, I couldn't get anything going... Um, the first one was KWEU, which was a gap and crap that didn't, you know, unfortunately I, I kind of got, uh, I don't know what the word is, just just terrible execution on this one. Um, you know, as you know, if you've been following along, I, I've been trying to trade gap and craps more frequently this year, much more frequently than, than previous years, really. Previous years I haven't traded them at all. Um, and there's plenty of wins from this month, and we'll go over like one or two or later in the video. But uh, but QWE here was one that, you know, really added to the, to the 10K red week here. Um, if we look at the trades, I mean, yeah, I got short. One, I kind of chased it a bit. I should have probably gotten short much higher once it started breaking this view up area and these kind of higher high or higher lows. Instead, I don't get short till literally, looks like maybe the morning low of day, which is just a bit of a chase. Um, yes, it does initially work, which looks great. But then it crawls its way back. I cover over a high day, practically put in the top, right? My last red candle is like literally at the high. Um, and then it pulls back and yet yeah, does it ever fade back to these 60s? No, so it wouldn't have really been a big win anyway But nonetheless, it's never fun covering at the top only to see it kind of chop around the rest of the day and never really 
give you a squeeze higher to make yourself feel better. And short sellers know exactly what I'm talking about. Maybe you do longs as well. Like if you if you're a long and you sell something and it then doesn't go lower than where you stopped out, it's kind of frustrating, right? Even though if you followed your plan, it sucks. And so yes, I followed my plan. Um, maybe I took a few cents and slipped it because I would have liked to cover more, you know, at like a little over the low ones and didn't get fills until like the one teens, like 111, 112, 113, 114. Um, so did add some slippage. I believe I lost like 40 or not 40, 7,800 or so on this. So a little bit bigger than I wanted um, on top of, again, the frustration of just, it was just literally, I put it in the top. Um, so again, that was a big portion of, of the red week. And then on top of that, um, where is it? Uh, oh, this is one of the, this is one of the FFIE losses, right? Of all those kind of those tilted losses of now I just kept trying to catch the 50 cent breakdown. Um, only to then just get immediately squeezed. So that was one that we talked about earlier, but that's the, that's the trade there. Um, but back to the, the 10K losing week, DEFTF. So we had KWE losses there. DEFTF should have been one that really brought the, tr- the week home uh, and been the main trader of that week. However, just due to a couple, two or three scenarios here or just things that happened really changes the result of the trade. And so I really wanted to go in this one um, and talk about that. So if we go into, you know, let's just do an intraday. Now, obviously you see the trade. Obviously, if you follow my videos enough, you know, I'm looking short sell this thing. Perfect multi-day runner from, you know, sub one all the way up to two. Um, tons of green days in a row. And so I'm looking for the first red day, the first sign of backside, etc. Now, I thought that was going to be here. I thought as it was selling off midday into red green, I thought to myself, if this broke red green, it would be pretty ugly and the panic would only get worse. Um, unfortunately, I got a little bit over over my head or ahead of myself shorting before red green only to see it hold perfectly, you know, by a penny or two and have this really delayed kind of bounce. It wasn't a quick recovery. It was like, you know, again, you see it for five or 10 minutes here. It just, it was kind of trying to decide, is it weak enough? Is it strong enough? Ultimately, I ended up realizing it was strong enough and just squeezed everyone right back to a new high day. And so I cover it. Unfortunately, losing seven grand. I mean, immediately seven grand. Um, was it a loss I was prepared to lose? Yes. Did I think I was going to lose it this quickly? No, I thought I would have been able to maybe get an opportunity to size down, maybe realize that it's not breaking down here after, you know, maybe a small bounce and hold. Instead, it was just straight up. And so it was the worst case scenario for me, which was losing seven grand. However, because it squeezed everybody out and then literally never went higher. I mean, very similar to KWE, it lit, just faded, you know, from there. And so I thought to myself, you know what, this is going to close pretty weak. This is going to look one of the more weaker candles of its daily run-up. Um, I am very open to shorting small overnight with the idea of adding if it can actually finally break red-green. Um, kind of the same plan, but just with way less size. Obviously, it took too much size too early here. Took, you know, in hindsight, you'll see here, took too little size, um, which we'll talk about in a second. But again, I just kept the swing going. I thought to myself, you know what? This is now a good little like double top, so to speak. Um, and as long as it doesn't gap up that high, which it hasn't been, it wasn't a really a big, uh, a typical one to gap very huge. Um, it was a risk I was willing to take. And again, I had like the 10th size. It was very small. Um, so we do that and it leads to the next day. And you know, that initial swing starter was correct. The problem was you see her opening at like two thirties and immediately down to the two tens. You know, even though this happened all in one minute, especially if we go to the chart here, right here, this candle, you might think this happened all in one minute. The reality is from here down to like sub 220 happened in less than like five seconds. It was so quick that unless you, I mean, I don't even know, unless you immediately put in a short order right out the open, you maybe got a chance to fill above one, above 220. And so like me being, being a human, uh, I naturally did not get short in the first second of the day. I wanted to wait for red green. The problem is by the time red green broke, it was immediately down into the two teens right? Like almost immediately. So filling really wasn't a great option for me. And so you see most, if not all of my size, again, the other, the other 90% of the position I want to take, I end up taking it in the, you know, 210, 212, 215 area right here. Um, why does this suck? Well, because had I filled this same size on red green in the 220s, I mean, that's a whole 10 cents higher. Um, and you'll see here how that makes a huge difference. That was going to be at least a few grand of a difference for me. Uh, on top of the fact is I remember telling myself when I looked at this daily chart, I said, when this has a first red day, this definitely can see the high of, uh, of this last red day, which is 175. Right? You kind of see this double top here uh, between the two days before it runs higher. I said, this could easily see 175. But yeah, you, you see me here covering some, you know, sub two, 
covering some more in the 190s and then covering it all at like 190 or 189. I mean, well away from 175. And what do you know how I just waited another 15 to 30 minutes? You actually do get that flush down into the mid 170s. Okay. Now, did it go much lower than that? Sure, but I'm not going to be perfect. I, I it frankly went much lower than I expected. So, you know, just sticking to the 175 area. Um, ultimately, missing 10 cents on the entry and then missing well over 10 cents on the exit. I mean, that cost me close to 10 grand um, in, un in gains that wasn't captured again. And I'm not even trying to be perfect, right? Uh, and so then you and then you add on top of the fact that I lost 7K on the trade before. I know the brokers naturally is going to combine both trades. Um, so losing 7K made about 9-ish K on this trade in particular. But then again, missing 10K from the, or like let's call it 5K on the entry, 5K on the exit, um, give or take. You know, what should have been a maybe 10 to 15K trade, ultimately after a little bit pricier of commissions, I only made like 2,500 on this trade, like somewhere in the two grand range. So it was a big, big difference. Um, so those three indicators, right, or three factors, the loss in the beginning, the late entry, and the early exit, I mean, really makes a difference. Um, so a chart like this, that is, is frankly very, very good for my style, to only walk away up about two grand on it short, was pretty disappointing. Uh, I, I don't like the taste in my mouth when I walk away from that. Obviously, yes, it is it is better than losing, but at the same time, it was a pretty straightforward trade, um, and it just just butchered it when you get, when you have enough you know when there's enough margin for error and you kind of take it all under your belt um, or take it just just uh, you know tick off the boxes for every little margin of error that can happen. Um, you know that's what happens. So where are we at? So that was that was week two. Um, week three here was a good 20k week, and this was mainly due to some gap and craps and Nvidia. Um, so if we go to Rally, Rally was a great gap and crap, right? This was awesome one that spiked, uh, and they did a reverse split. Actually, that's so funny they did it quickly. Um, this was not at $18; it was at like a dollar. Um, ran from I guess in this case, you know, 10 to 18. It was more like we'll show. Actually, we'll look at the trades here. Let's get rid of DEFTF. Rally, yeah, this went to 110. Um, so. Opened up, where is this? Oh, that's not what we want. Let's, we'll go back over that one in a bit. Um, rally here, what opened, what it looks like, 60 cents, ran to as high as 110. And then for me, I really liked, well, at the time I liked it, once I was in it, I realized I didn't like it, but I liked the idea of a new lower low being set, right? Set one new low here, set another significant low there, set another one there. So I thought to myself, you know, there's a world where this can fail pretty heavily. It just needs, I need to, I'm not gonna just blindly short the front side, right? I want to try to get some kind of indication that it's weak and dying. So I thought a new lower low here in this case was gonna be it. Um, it kind of looked like it and then it started bouncing. So I was like, great, this is just gonna rip my face off back up over a high day. Um, again, after just losing to KWE last week, I was like, oh, this is not gonna be fun. Um, does fade off, so like, okay, looking better. Comes back over via Wii app, and in this period of time, there was probably like four or five times where I had to remind myself to stick in the trade because I was like, no, you can cover now and save yourself a bigger loss, like if it squeezes. And again, I know that that's a game I play with myself. I know it's a game a lot of traders play with themselves, which is like, why not cover now and save the inevitable loss? Um, when the reality is, you you don't even know if you're gonna have to stop out or not, right? You, that's the power of, or that's the problem with being in the trade real time is that you can only know what happens in hindsight. And so the best thing to do is to stick to the trade plan at hand. Thank God I did that because eventually, you know, what looked scary to me in, in at the moment, all you had to do was wait an hour and now the fading has begun and it just got crushed. I mean, it, it literally sold off well over 50% off its highs. I'm able to cover some at like 50 cents and then the rest at like 40 cents, um, ultimately creating this amazingly ugly candle. Um, and they made like 8K on this one. So unfortunately kind of covered the KWE loss, so to speak. Um, but that was a really, a really good, another good grab and grab. Um, there was another one, MGOL. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of this one. There's a couple of trades I just blanked and forgot to take a picture of, but there was this one as well. Uh, I made, I think a few grand on this one too. Yeah, this day. Um, the other trade that was really good was Nvidia. Again, I, I wish I took a picture of it cause it was really, I was really happy with this trade. Um, but I just, I, 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 I don't know. I blanked this day. Um, now, a lot of traders who would like to trade large caps are watching this ticker, uh, mainly because if you've been following it at all, I mean, it is it is like the top performing stock in the last 10 to 20 years. I mean, not 20, maybe 10 to 15. It's it's absolutely incredible um, how great of a run it's had. And so naturally going into, or after a reverse split, or not reverse split, regular stock split, it went from, you know, what, what was it? 1,200 down to 120. Um, 
it just kept running. It, it, then it went from 120 all the way as 140. I was being a little picky. I really wanted it to like make a, almost like make a parabolic push to 150, kind of like what we saw here in March. Um, but when we didn't, I, I, I just thought to myself, you know what, this could still fade and die. Um, it doesn't have to do what I want it to do perfectly at 150. And so I ultimately ended up, you know, just being flexible and getting short. Um, I did not get short for this crack. This is what told me or like gave me the first hint that like, hey, you know, this is weaker than you expect. You might need to be, you know, adaptive here um, and you might not get your, your, your 150. Now, the part where I played it safe but it also screwed me up is in previous large cap runs, um, whether it was SMCI back in February this year, whether it was Tesla when it ran to um, uh, 1,000 back in 2021, right? Speaking of Tesla, up huge today. Nice green green or green day. Um, it was either what, this move or this move. I remember getting chopped up very early where to the point where I was taking, you know, two, three, maybe sometimes four losses in a row and then finally maybe making all my game, my losses back and then maybe being up a little bit by the end of it just because I was, just because large caps are more choppy and more difficult to trade. And so going into NVIDIA, I knew, I told myself, I'm like, I could be, I could very well be early here um, given how strong the stock is. Like let, instead of risking three, four, five K a try and by three, four tries later, I'm down, you know, 10 to 20 grand. Let's try to risk small expecting to be wrong. And after I'm wrong two or three times, then I'll know the early entries are over and possibly there's a backside to come. Again, a little bit silly for me to think that because I should just read what the chart is telling me because the reality is it worked right away. This was one of the first large cap kind of reversion to the mean trades that like I was, the first time I touched it, it was right. Um, it's a good sign that lets me know I'm getting better at them, but also I need to adapt in the fact that I just need to be risking what I think is appropriate. And so in this case, I was risking much smaller. Instead of risking four or five K, I was risking like barely two K. Um, so I did get short small into like the 138 area. Um, once it started breaking down back into green, like again, I shorted and immediately was in red. So I was like, mm, this is this is where I get squeezed. But again, I kept it small to stay patient. Once it started rolling over even more is when I started adding and then moving my risk down to this bounce high. Uh, finally, at my last, add on that new low day move below 136. And then the rest was history and I covered it all in like the 131, 132 range. Uh, now I did want it to bounce to like 135 for the reshort. Unfortunately, it never got there. It actually stayed fairly weak the next day, and you know the next two days it gave you a great fade down to all the way to the one teens, right? The one one day 19, 18, 17 area, uh, and I never touched it again, unfortunately. Um, so I mean, you know, I made about 7k on this move, which is great considering it was a well positive, you know, over three to one risk reward. It's just unfortunate that I was very small, risking very small. So of course I only I only make 7k. Uh, I'm not knocking 7K, but there's another world where I should have been risking five and I could have made, you know, 15, 20. That's more my speed when it comes to like a, a chart like this. So there is that. Nonetheless, it did help me, you know, come down to a 20K week. And then the last week, the only real main thing here was, again, FFIE. <laughs> um, so back to FFIE when we ta were talking about the 50 cent breakdown, um, I had not forgotten about it. I was still convicted, even though I had taken, you know, three or four losses. Um, trying to time that break and only for it to support itself. I told myself, you know, the moment that everyone and everyone, the moment, the moment enough people forget this thing exists, it's going to roll over. I just need to be there for it. And so finally, you know, it, 50 cents didn't really become support. Really 49 became the support. And you can actually see this on this day where it breaks 50, but then it just has this really odd new bottom being formed at 49. Um, and so I thought to myself, okay, the next time 49 breaks, I should be interested and get involved. Um, and that's when it broke down here, right on the, what is this? The sixth or the 18th of June. Um, I almost didn't short it because I was like, you know what? I've already taken four or five losses on this breakdown idea. Like, do I really want to give it another shot? And I told myself, I was like, the moment you don't take it is the moment it's going to work. I remember t like having that dialogue with myself. I'm like, Kyle, if you don't take this one, this is the one that's going to work. Uh, and so that's why you see this entry here. I do get short, um, about 18 and a half or at 48 and a half cents, um, you know, risking the high of day of 51. Cause I thought to myself, if this is going to work, it needs to work right away. I, I don't need to get bounced back on like the other four or five times that I already have. Um, and it was great. It actually finally, for the ones it actually finally closed sub 49, sub 50, that support. This was the first kind of red day close below that support level, which was a very good start. Uh, and you know, the rest was history. So like, let's get rid of Rally. 
Um, all I had to do was stay patient for what? Next day, it really started to die. This was kind of true confirmation that the breakout down was working because it went all the way down to 40 now. So re- the acceleration, the downside, and the reality of like, oh crap, we're, we're going lower um, was happening. So now it was just a matter of time to really wait for, for sub 30, which again was that original thesis I had. Um, a little bit choppy, a day in between, but then for whatever reason, it just really started to bleed and, and I waited for that speed up and I, and I covered it all. Um, you know, got some at 30 and then more at 29 and then more at 28. And that was it. That just happened to be the bottom that day. Um, it looks really great now, but it's not like I knew the bottom was going to be 28. I just, I just wanted to cover sub 30. Um, I was not going to be greedy like I was last time when I said sub 50 and then when sub 50 came, I didn't take it. So when sub 30 came, I was like, I am taking it. Even this, even if this goes down to 20 cents, I I'm, I'm taking it here. Um, ironically it does do that. It does then go to 20 cents cause they, they put out a PR saying that they're, um, potentially or very interested in proposing a stock split. Um, so yeah, I made like 20k in that breakdown, which was really awesome. Making back, you know, the other all the other small losses of, of trying to catch that breakdown, which was nice. Then even better, and even more of a reason why I'm glad I, I covered it. Um, Rivian had vo- news with Volkswagen, and again, Rivian being an EV company, FFIE being a v- an EV company, even though it's it's terrible at being an EV company, um, for whatever reason, got it to spike back. So so much for that breakdown. It immediately went back from 30 all the way up to 60, and the next day gapped up. Now, if you look at the daily chart here, um, every time this has had a strong, big volume green day, right here on the 30th, it gapped up and sold off right here on the 7th of June, um, it actually sold off a bit, but then still gapped up right over here. Yeah, still gapped up and sold off. So ergo, you know, what do you think I think is going to happen? A strong green day, it's likely going to gap up, which honestly, I could have argued taking it long overnight, but I didn't. Um, but once again, it gaps up. So what do I think it's going to do? It's probably going to sell off and not hold its gains. So that's exactly what I did. Um, you can see here I started getting short. Let's get rid of the breakdown. Um, started getting short, small into that morning spike, then adding ones that confirmed weakness and breaking um, the low of day around like 60 cents or so. Um, covered some into the low 50s, added into bounces, uh, added into late day. Um, frankly, I thought this was going to be a little bit weaker. It did support 50 like perfectly. I thought there was a world where this would kind of trade sideways for the most of the day and then late day start selling off sub 50. Um, didn't happen. Actually, was a little bit, you know, resilient and coming back. However, you know, again, look at the daily chart. You know, gaps down. This one gapped up, but sold off. But again, you wait one more day, it's already lower. Um, same thing here, sells off a little bit lower. So naturally, I knew to myself, you know, if I can just somehow ma- make a trade plan that keeps me from not stopping out for over one or two days, this is gonna go back down, um, and but lower than fifty cents. And so that's kind of was the plan. Um, that's why I did add some here. But then I realized, you know what? in a world where this does gap up over these highs and I have to cut it, I'd rather be smaller. So I did downsize these ads in after hours. Um, and then they PR'd. The PR was something about them being compliant and not gonna be delisted by the NASDAQ. And so it did pop on that news. However, it didn't scare me initially. Obviously I would have cut if it went over you know, the high day of 69, but it faded pretty quickly back and it wasn't a shock to me because it wasn't that they were, they regained compliance so that they're not going to get delisted. It's that they're just not going to get delisted immediately and they still have to meet the requirements to prevent getting delisted. So they still have to um, announce earnings on time, which is what they were getting threatened of getting delisted for. And they still have to get their stock price back to over a dollar, which is what they were going to get delisted for. So like nothing had changed. I'm not, I'm not really certain as to why they even cared about letting people know they were still compliant or weren't getting delisted. I guess it was that bad where the NASDAQ was on the verge of delisting them just anyway, like screw you guys, your guys are so bad. Maybe that was the, 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 the scenario. Um, so it's like, they just said, yeah, we're not going to delist you, but you still are eligible to get delisted if you don't fix your problem. So like really it wasn't, it was kind of a meaningless PR, hence why it came back down and, and didn't really go anywhere. And then, you know, the next day it gapped down um, one thing too, and the reason why I think it gapped down is because it actually turned kind of negative, meaning that if they aren't getting delisted, that means they have to do a reverse split to stay compliant. Otherwise, they're getting delisted. Again, it's another lose lose. You either you either don't reverse split and get delisted, or you do a reverse split, which is already negative in itself for this company. So it's like a lose lose. You know, it, it gaps down the next day. Um, ultimately, it's a big panic. Goes sub fifty, which was again get the previous day's support. So I cover the rest there. Um, getting some out, you know, the 46s, 47s, 48s. And uh, again, 
did time this really well at the bottom? Did I know this was going to be the bottom? No, I'm just scaling out into levels that I think were meaningful, which was a sub 50 panic. Um, that was it. Made like 22 grand on this on this trade too. Um, didn't reshort. I kind of checked out mentally for, for once this was over. Although this was a good reshort into the high 50s and could have covered into low 50s. Uh, but it is what it is. Uh, ultimately, you know, ending the week up 60k there, uh, and then ending up the month 260k there. So very very awesome. Uh, very happy with the month overall. Um, obviously, you can guys can see how July is going. Only two days in. Also a very good start over here. Um, so we'll see again. I, 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 I don't care how long it takes for me to get back over there. Uh, if it takes you know, the rest of the year, if it takes next week, you know, clearly I'm not, I'm on a good start back, but that doesn't mean anything. It's just, you know, P and L on a screen. Um, the reality is sticking to my process and what has gotten me here over the last eight years is what is actually important. Um, and so, yeah, I think I'm better for it. Obviously, um, my risk management, I think has been much better because if you notice, I had, didn't even take a over five figure loss. Um, in June. Now, that doesn't mean I was prepared to do it. Obviously, if, if some a other A plus setup came aboard or are in front of me, of course I'd be willing to lose you know 10 to 15k on it. But it didn't really happen. There was nothing that that great. There were a lot of solid things, but nothing amazing for my style. Um, and yeah, you know I could ramble all day long. But uh, thanks so much for watching, guys. Um, we will see you guys at the end of July. Hopefully, it goes continues to do well, just as well as uh, June. So thanks so much for watching, and uh, I'll see you guys next time. Peace.